Bible, 1 Corinthians. We're picking up in chapter 2 of 1 Corinthians, and we just discussed, uh, you know, that God uh, doesn't use just man's wisdom, he, but he demonstrates his power, and uh, that's what uh, really consummates the preaching of the gospel is his power and the witness of the Holy Spirit. And so we, uh, we get here, Paul has just said that, his, that he preaches not in words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the power and spirit, so that our faith would rest in the power of God, not in the wisdom of men. And he goes on in verse 7 of 1 Corinthians 2, it says, But we speak God's wisdom in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God predestined before the ages of our glory, the wisdom which none of the rulers of this age has understood, for if they had understood it, they would not, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. You know, the, the, they didn't understand how death could be uh, any kind of demonstration of the power of God. But the death of Jesus... Uh, was that power that broke the power of sin and paid for the sin. And so the, the rulers of this world had no idea that this was the, the power of the cross and what was taking place at that time. So uh, Paul talks about uh, human wisdom compared to God's wisdom, and he finishes chapter 2 with that. In chapter 3, uh, Paul begins to tell them once again how fleshly they are in following the messengers of Christ. They're just following, not following Christ, but... Uh, he, he says this in verse 5, What then is Apollos, and what is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one. And in verse 9 it says, For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, God's building. He's trying to say, he's bringing the attention because they've gotten into, it's almost like personality cults, like we have in this day. Well, I follow so-and-so. I'm looking at a, a shelves of books here and all the people that you could follow. You could follow this one or this one or this one. And that's what was happening in the church there. They were being divided over, they were following, they were really into this guy's podcast, and that's who they believed, you know, whatever. And so Paul's trying to straighten this out because they've gotten really diverted in their thinking. In verse 10, it says, uh, But according to the grace of God which was given to me as a wise master builder, I laid a foundation, and another is building upon it. But let each man be careful how he builds upon it. For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man builds upon the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each man's work will become evident, for the day will show it, because it is to be revealed with fire, and the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work which he has built upon it remains, he shall receive reward. If any man's work is burned up, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so through fire. He's just talking about, you know, all of us are going to be judged by our works, including him. And it says, and what we've done that's going to be, that was good, it was precious stones and gold and silver, it'll withstand the test of fire. But each one of us is going to be tested in a judgment of the works that we've done in this life. Some of them will be burned up. He said the works can be burned up, but we will be saved. The person would suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so is through fire. So once again, Paul is just working on trying to get us away from the thinking of following these, these messengers the messengers are not the important thing. The message is the important thing, and the message is all about Christ. And so he, he goes on with that, and then he ends this chapter in uh, verses 21 through 23. So then let no one boast in men, for all things belong to you, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all things belong to you. You belong to Christ, and Christ belongs to God. What Paul's saying here is that uh, he's saying the church isn't mine. You know, I belong to the church. I'm yours. You're not mine. I'm yours. Paul is a gift to the body of Christ. Apollos is a gift to the body of Christ. You don't belong to us. We belong to you. And so he's trying to, he's changing things around here, giving a different perspective. So he goes on and he continues to talk about uh, uh, being a servant of Christ. And in chapter 4, verse 3, it says, But to me it is a very small thing that I should be examined by you or by any human court. In fact, I do not even examine myself. For I am conscious of nothing against myself, yet I am not by this acquitted. But the one who examines me is the Lord. Therefore, do not go on passing judgment before the time, but wait until the Lord comes who will bring to light the things hidden in the darkness and disclose the motives of men's hearts, and then each man's praise will come from, to him from God. So once again, he's trying to say, uh, we are not the important thing. The important thing is, are you doing what you're doing before the Lord? And it's going to be examined by him. He said, I'm not even concerned. I'm, it doesn't, doesn't matter to me if you judge me. If you're judging 
my life, if you're judging what I'm doing, it, it doesn't even really uh, matter to me. He says, he does, that doesn't make me innocent. Uh, I'm not acquitted just because uh, I don't care if I'm judged by you. But he says, the, the, the important thing is everything is going to be judged by the Lord and things, secrets of the heart will even be exposed at that time. And so uh, that's what this chapter, once again, continues on with what he's been speaking. And it, it's focusing on not relying on the, the servant, but relying on the message of, of the, who the servant is talking about. And it's talking about Jesus Christ. Uh, in verse 19 of chapter 4, it says, I will soon come to you if the Lord wills, and I shall find out not the words of those who are arrogant, but their power. So there's an arrogance going on, and people are just promoting themselves and their own wisdom, and I'm following the right guy, and you're following the wrong guy. And Paul just says, okay, I'm coming. And we're going to find out not, not the, just the words of somebody, but what about their power? For the kingdom of God, verse 20, does not consist in words, but in power. What do you desire? Shall I come to you with a rod or with love and a spirit of gentleness? Well, I would say uh, I'd prefer a love and a spirit of gentleness myself. Forget the rod. Uh, it, it's like uh, I've told people the difference between Nehemiah and Ezra in the Old Testament. Uh, Nehemiah, or Ezra, when he heard that they, the people were sinning, he tore his clothes and he pulled out his hair and he mourned. Nehemiah, when he heard they're sinning, he tore out their hair and he beat some of them. So what do you want? You want me to come with a rod or do you want me to come with gentleness? And I would say I like the gentleness thing more as if it's coming to me, you know. Uh, but he's saying that we're going to find out not just by your words, but what kind of power, what kind of anointing do you bring into the situation? Paul said he didn't speak his words in, in worldly wisdom, but in the power of God and in the Holy Spirit. He says, when I come, we'll find out. Who's, who's got the authority here? So uh, in chapter 5, he's going in and, and uh, really, it's talking about some a really strange situation, a, a hard situation here. In verse 5, I said there was a lot of problems in this church. Here's one of them. And there's a man who's reportedly having sexual relationships with his father's wife. Now, it doesn't say his mother, but his father's wife. Uh, and he, he says... Uh, I have decided, in verse 5, chapter 5, I have decided to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Now, this is a, uh, a, a passage that a lot of people uh, wonder about, and I do too, but I know as an early, early believer and in leadership as a young man and other leaders with other young men, we tried to follow the Bible, and I remember we had a, a situation where we had someone in the church who was, uh, <clears throat> he was uh, saying he was a prophet. He had some authority and power, but he was also beating his wife and promoting racism and, I mean, just blatantly. And uh, we came to the point where we approached him. Uh, he was lying about some of his stories and his background. And we approached him and he just didn't listen. And we, we, we said, we guess we took this and thought, I guess this is what we're supposed to do. Deliver such a one over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. That's, that's a statement. So what is it talking about? Well, I don't know fully, but it's like the judgment coming against your flesh so that you may be redeemed when, when uh, the Lord comes. In 1 Thessalonians, we see the difference. It says, may you be preserved body, soul, and spirit to the coming of the Lord Jesus. Here it's like your flesh will be destroyed so that your spirit may be saved. And so controversy, misunderstanding, I don't know, but this was a serious church discipline matter. And he said, it's more important that this man suffers something in his flesh right now, that his spirit be saved, than you just let this, this cancer go on in your, in your church. And so uh, he goes on, he, verse 9 of chapter 5, I wrote you in my letter not to associate with immoral people. I did not mean at all with the immoral people of this world or with the covetous and swindlers or with idolaters, for then you would have to go out of the world. But actually I wrote to you not to associate with any so-called brother if he should be an immoral person or covetous, an idolater, reviler, drunkard, or swindler, not even to eat with such a one. And so here, wow, he's saying, here I've got some instruction for you. If there's someone in the church, says they're a believer, but they're living in immorality, he says, don't associate with them. That's a hard thing. He's trying to bring some kind of discipline by, by bringing uh, you know, accountability to them for their behavior. And he said, he, I didn't say don't associate with immoral people in the world. Otherwise, you wouldn't have anyone to associate with. He said, 
Don't associate with those that call themselves Christians. Don't even eat with them if they're living in these kind of behaviors. 